Thanks for coming. My name is, uh, is Dr. Connor Williams. I'm a senior researcher here in New America's education policy program. Uh, this is New America's third event in our series on systemic racial injustice in the United States. We're calling the series Moment to Movement. And the hashtag, if you're posting to social media on that, uh, about this is, is just that. It's moment to movement, except uh, a two, the numeral two, rather than T-O to save you a character. So while you have your phones on your minds, also please mute them. Uh, we'd, we'd like no interruptions for this event. Uh, so today's event features a discussion of how systemic racism in the United States permeates the education system. Uh, this is an area of intense interest for those of us working here uh, on New America's education team and, and really throughout New America, which is why I want to call out the work specifically of my colleagues Shana Cook uh, and, and Kirsten Holtz, who really made this event happen. Now, as, a, as a former first grade teacher whose students were uniformly, all of them, students of color, children of color, people of color. Uh, this is an issue that I care about deeply, but I have only very brief introductory remarks for you. Because many years ago, w when I was a freshman at Bowdoin College, which by the way, most of you, if any of you even have heard of it, uh, you'll know it as the alma mater of DeRay McKesson as well, uh, one of the, the leading protesters, the, one of the leading uh, curators and, and advocates who was in Ferguson, he's now in Baltimore, and he's been in New York and many other places as well. But when I was at Bowdoin College, I joined the school's African American Society uh, because I thought it was a simple decision. Uh, I knew myself to be a, a lover of diversity, a hater of racism, a progressive who cared about issues related to race. Uh, but I soon discovered that that sort of earnest enthusiasm was, had serious limitations, right? That my own racial privilege made it extremely difficult for me to understand how to be the right kind of ally for my classmates. Uh, thinking I understood did not mean actually understanding their experiences uh, with racism, educational or otherwise. So because of that chastening experience, uh, you know, I'm far from knowing the answer to how to be the right ally so far. Uh, I've learned that privileged white men who want to support the cause of racial injustice, or racial justice rather, in the United States should always do more listening than speaking. So I'm eager to introduce our conversation partners here today, and, and uh, we have limited time, so excuse me if I'm very brief. Uh, you have each speaker's bio in your event materials, and, and you should be able to look that up if, if, you, if you'd like. Uh, on today's panel, we have Howard University Professor Dr. Bahia Muhammad, uh, DC Trust Executive Director uh, Ed Davies, New York City educator and author Jose Wilson, and the Advancement Project's uh, Thomas Mariadison. Nicole Hannah-Jones from the New York Times will be our moderator. Uh, but before we, we launch into the panel, I'd like to introduce uh, Howard University's Jamisha Morgan to give some introductory remarks. Jamisha is a graduating senior, tomorrow graduating senior, at Howard University. Uh, and she's been an on-campus leader as well as an advocate for criminal justice and for prison reform in the United States. So please join me in welcoming Jamisha to the podium. Thank you all. Um, I'm definitely, definitely um, excited to graduate from Howard University tomorrow. I am a graduating senior receiving a Bachelor's of Science in Psychology as well as a Bachelor of Arts in Administration of Justice from Howard University. I will be pursuing my Juris Doctorate at the University of Southern California in August. So thank you all again for having me. Um, and I'll actually be introducing each speaker um, individually. So we have, again, Dr. Bahia Muhammad, who is the Assistant Professor of Criminology at Howard University. Dr. Bahia Muhammad received her BS in Administration of Justice from Rutgers University, New Brunswick campus with a minor in psychology and a criminology certificate. Dr. Muhammad became a Ronald E. McNair Scholar and Minority Academic Career Program Undergraduate Research Fellow. She also spent a semester as a research intern at the University of Natal located in South Africa, where she interviewed natives on their attitudes toward justice, um, towards the criminal justice system. Dr. Muhammad went on to receive her MS in criminal justice from John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City. As a graduate, she presented research findings at numerous professional conferences, such as those held by the Academy of Criminal Justice Science, American Society of Criminology, Sisters of the Academy, and the American Correction Association. Dr. Muhammad received her PhD from Rutgers University School of Criminal Justice, where she specialized in families and communities affected by mass incarceration. Her particular, particular area of expertise, excuse me, rests in the 
in the lived experiences of children of incarcerated parents. Dr. Muhammad has spent the last decades of her criminal justice career conducting ethnographic work about children ages 7 to 18 living in urban communities throughout New Jersey who have experienced the loss of one or both of their parents to the prison system. Introducing Dr. Bahia Muhammad. Thank you so much. It is an honor and a privilege to be here uh, with you guys today. Um, this is definitely a major conversation that is happening all around the nation. Currently, I come to you from doing a presentation for the New Jersey Education Association where we were looking at the human rights of children of incarcerated parents and how can we make the school systems a better place to um, end the school to prison pipeline. And so a lot of the things that that discussion revolved around um, are some of the things I will share with you today. Um, a lot of the parents who are residing in these low income areas feel that there is no hope in terms of the things that they can provide for their particular children. And so out of that workshop, we came up with some um, things that individuals can do within their own communities to be able to help children um, as they navigate through the school systems. One of these things are definitely connected and affected to this idea of fear. A lot of the teachers uh, discussed in small focus groups that they had a fear of the students that they were to uh, report in each day and teach. And these are non-minority teachers who are discussing and disclosing in private um, focus groups that they are fearful of the students because of the lack of um, coherence to school regulations and through policies. And it really affects the day-to-day -day inside of the classroom. So one of the things that we've been trying to manage is this idea of fear. How do you continue to go in and be an esteemed teacher and help individuals um, in order to pass through a system that you're afraid of? Some of the things that we discussed and that we've been implementing um, most recently in a school district in New York is to have panels of students and teachers where we create safe spaces for individuals to have this conversation. When we talk to young individuals who are in these particular school systems, they have no idea that their teachers are fearful of them. They're not looking at the other individual or the person on the short end of the stick. So they're not looking at the individual that they threw the chalk at. They're not looking at the individual that they uh, blew spitballs to. And so one of the things that we started to create was this idea to have students and teachers have an open conversation about the realities of what they're experiencing. We found that immediately following these sessions that it allowed the students to see their teachers as human beings and vice versa. It allowed the teachers to um, also come into class with um, a better attitude toward trying to achieve the goal of success. Another thing that um, we've identified in some of these working groups are that a lot of the research that's out there on populations that we're talking about specifically affected by the school to prison pipeline, there are negative things that are dictated in the research. Mine specifically focuses on children of incarcerated parents and we know all of the negative aspects um, that children are faced when they have an incarcerated parent. And right now they're saying that these individuals have a greater likelihood of spending time in prison just because they were born to these criminogenic parents. And so my research, Far From the Tree, is identifying some of the success stories, some of those children who have managed to navigate through the system. Some of them are graduating from Princeton. Some of my sample are coming directly from my university at Howard University, as well as Harvard. And they talk about these relationships that go against what the data says. But for me, I think the, the biggest takeaway that we need to grapple with and start to really look at honestly is this idea that um, the research is governing a lot of what we think and it governs the rhetoric, the language that we have in order to talk about it. So if we start from a negative place and we don't have any of the positive, we'll never be able to kind of walk down the middle. Okay, I think um, I am supposed to get started on, you know, right? Okay. Um, so we don't have a lot of time. We have a lot of questions and I want to make sure that the audience also has a chance to answer questions. So I'm going to moderate. You see me give a little signal, wrap it up. I'm not being rude, just trying to do my job. Um, so we're going to start off. The concept of school to prison pipeline, sometimes called the schoolhouse to jailhouse pipeline, 
thanks to the work of a lot of advocates and researchers, has really uh, entered the national lexicon. But I wonder if we might start with a definition for people in the audience. Um, and anyone or a couple of you can take this up. But what exactly are we talking about when we say the school to prison pipeline? And when did this become a noted phenomenon? Ed, would you like to? Uh, well, actually, I would turn it to Thomas because this is okay, probably sure. more of your yeah. area than um, mine. Sure. <laughs> Um, so I work for a place called the Advancement Project, and um, I'm a staff attorney in our schoolhouse to jailhouse track program. So we've been working on school to prison pipeline issues for um, almost uh, since we've been around, for, which is about 15 years. Um, and so our understanding of the school, to, what the school to prison pipeline is, is that it's a it's a combination of things, right? It's a combination of both policies and practices that um, uh, really are structured towards, um, in a very racially biased way. Um, taking kids, uh, deprioritizing education for students of color um, and criminalizing the behavior of students of color in such a way as to um, lead them down the pathway towards um, system involvement, criminal justice involvement, incarceration. Um, and that's a very brief one. We can, I can go a little more in depth, but if you wanted to... No, I think that's yeah. good. So when, when did this become noted kind of as a, a growing phenomenon? Sorry, do you... <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Well, actually, I'd, I'd the way you phrase the question is actually interesting to me because it seems like the what became a noted phenomenon is really what I would just call a fad because if you ask the many young people and generations of young people who have been affected by this, they'll tell you uh, throughout history this has been the way things have been and it's only now that we're actually turning an eye to it and sort of commoditize it as something sexy, something that we can talk about in public discourse even though it's something that's been affecting uh, people of color for a while. So. I imagine um, part of that has to do with two things. One, uh, we have Columbine happens, right? And so I know a lot of people kind of trace the involvement of policing in schools and zero tolerance to this moment when we have start to have school shootings. Um, but also collection of data, which we didn't have before either. So while we knew it was happening, we couldn't quantify it. So I wonder if you guys could talk about kind of the role that Columbine and school shootings did play in, in starting to see at least an increase in law enforcement in schools and the impacts of that. I was just going to say, I don't think that's been that um, change, like the phenomenon hasn't really changed for urban settings or in places where there are black youth. So I grew up, you know, in the public school system and, you know, th there was always a story about some, some student getting shot up for their pair of J's, their Jordans or whatever have you. And of course, police had to come in and, as, you know, I guess Columbine for us made it I guess national because it was a different set of students. So for me, when I looked at it, I said, okay, well, now it's, become, it's gonna become a national story because the students look different. Uh, whereas with the public schools that I frequented or I passed by, there was always a situation. There was always police hovering around and there were always police precincts um, being uh, commissioned right to uh, our public schools, and especially the ones that I guess people would call failing, if you will. Yeah, and I think, I mean, Columbine definitely triggered, um, you know, a tremendous amount of funding from the federal and state level um, towards, you know, implementing cops in schools. You know, I think it's, at some point the federal government was giving about $180 million for cops in schools every year, um, metal detectors. Um, and I guess the, the, the sad, tragic, infuriating irony is that, you know, to this day Columbine doesn't have metal detectors, but, you know, we've seen the rapid militarization of, you know, inter schools in all of our urban areas where there are concentrations of um, uh, students of color. And I think uh, to add to that, you know, I think even though the discourse around school to prison pipeline has like improved in the sense that like we're talking about it, we have a panel right now about it, it's in the discourse, it's in the, in the, com the language. Um, there are things that have continued to ramp up um, the militarization of schools. So Newtown, you know, the Newtown shooting also injected some more federal and state funding into um, securitizing schools. And then, you know, something as crazy as this 1033 program, which we found about during Ferguson, where um, military surplus equipment was going to not just the school police, to police departments, but to, you know, Los Angeles, LA Unified School District didn't just get, um, you know, some guns, they got 61 rifles, grenade launchers, and a, you know, mine-proof vehicle, you know, and they returned the, the grenade launchers because that was, like, really bad, but they kept the mine-proof vehicle. So um, I don't, didn't know cherry bombs could, like, you know, were that serious, but, um, you know, 
So we've seen that this is like an ongoing issue that um, has yet to be rectified and that you know, the, f the funding at the state and federal level is continuing to, to keep us in this militarized um, position. So I think, I mean, I think irony is, is a great word because when we look at, particularly with funding, and we know how funding works with law enforcement, you have to show that you have a problem and that's how you get more funding. And so you have law enforcement that writes grants saying, we have these concerns, we have these security concerns, and that's how money is, is poured into schools, is that the policies and the funding were designed to deal with crimes committed largely by white males. But of course, the irony then is that the implementation has, has disproportionately impacted black males and also uh, brown youth as well. So we know that black students are suspended and expelled at three times the rate of white students. Um, I wonder, Ed, if you can talk about kind of the relationship between the rise of zero tolerance and kind of this, um, I think this disproportionate discipline has always been a problem in black schools, but there's definitely been a ratcheting up and more police presence in schools. I don't think it's a mistake it's not a coincidence that it, that has led to more arrests in schools. So can you talk a little bit about the correlation between those two? Yes, well the correlation um, certainly exists in terms of the changes in policies where in, in efforts as we went to this high stakes testing and ways of needing to control classrooms to maximize test results, we need to weed out the bad seeds. And so a lot of zero tolerance policies were implemented as we began to ramp up with police presence in schools and that widened the pipeline the school to prison pipeline so that more young people went through it faster. Um, and the issue is we are trying to address through um, juvenile justice education issues and the problems that exist in how we educate our kids, how we view our kids, and the dehumanization of young people so that it's easier to just pluck them out and put them on a path that leads to nowhere for them versus doing the hard work in terms of how we better educate kids. And so it's like we're taking a sledgehammer to a problem that, res that requires a feather. So it's, it's starting very young. I think one of the most startling statistics probably for most of us that came out of the Office of Civil Rights data was about preschoolers, right? So one, what, what was shocking to me was that we were actually suspending and expelling three and four year olds, which I think most of us probably didn't even know that was happening. But then two, that half of those preschool students who are um, suspended and expelled for at least one day are black. So that, that criminalization of our youth are, are starting really with, with toddlers and, and um, young children. So I wonder if Jose and Dr. Muhammad, if you can speak about kind of your reaction to those stats, learning these large numbers of very young children who are already being suspended and expelled, and kind of what that, how that kind of gets a ball rolling for them down the line when already at that age they're being put out of school. And I, I'm particularly interested in your perspective as a teacher in the classroom. There's two elements I always talk about when I come into these panels. One is that there's this big idea about this uh, teach like a champion thing, which I'm sure some of you have heard about. Um, there's this idea that if you just get kids to do exactly what you say at exactly the right time, then you will get them to learn very, very well via test score. The issue with that is uh, people have exacerbated it to the point where every little move you make or not make becomes an issue of criminality. So you can get suspended for having the wrong dress code, for um, having a, the wrong reaction to a teacher, for the, the slightest uh, infractions. And we're seeing this, and of course, people always say, oh, well, it looks like it's happening in Mississippi. It's happening in Arkansas. And I'm like, no, it's happening in New York City. It's happening in all the places we call liberal, because people want to focus on the idea that you can get black kids to behave very, very well, as long as you know they, well, in some cases, they even pee on themselves to try to stay in school. And yet, that's permissible insofar as they follow the regulations to, um, to a T. And then there's a second element, too, when we talk about, for instance, hiring teachers of color. There's this idea that if you just hire enough, then you'll fix a lot of the problems. Yet and still, uh, what a lot of people see when they see a teacher of color, a principal of color, whoever may have you, it, a small side effect, which you need to talk about more often, is this idea that when you put a teacher of color, specifically a male teacher of color, they're not there as an educator, but as an overseer. Mm -hmm. And that's the other part too that we need to grapple with. Mm -hmm. How do we get the people who we're activating from the community to not be overseers, but to be um, activated within community and be part of engaging better people, not just better kids, not just better students, whatever, better people to build them and mold them uh, in a 360 sort of model all the way through. And that's something that I always, I think about when I hear about preschoolers getting um, 
arrested even. Like I've seen that before and I'm just like, I'm horrified. You just stripped the joy out of this child because you wanted better test scores or you just wanted to make sure that you had a zero tolerance policy and you wanted to have an example. Yet and still, the, the examples end up being children of color, specifically girls. It's a, a higher rate now uh, than, than boys. It's like a faster rate with black girls rising and we need to have that conversation more often than not. For me, that statistic wasn't really that surprising. Um, if you look at it from a criminological perspective, um, the super predator myth, when you teach uh, juvenile delinquency, is one of the first things you start with. It was a criminal justice professor who basically dictated and argued um, through writing, and it was well publicized, that the next generation of youth are going to be more bloody, more nasty, not care about anybody than any of the individuals we incarcerated. And so it garnered a whole lot of fear in so many different individuals. And that same year, you had the No Child Left Behind Act that was passed. And so at that same time, you also throw into the pool uh, prison privatization, and you started to see um, from research data that um, a lot of the health care that was being provided to correctional institutions were for younger individuals. And so it only makes sense to start incarcerating individuals at a younger age because to outsource to get health care, they need to be younger. Health industries are not giving services to prisons in order to care for the inmates who are incarcerated unless they're 13, unless they're 12, or unless they're 10. And you started to see a lot of the rules and regulations and laws that govern society go into that direction as well. Also, um, a lot of the prison beds are built in advance. And so if the fourth grade reading levels for children are low, they are building prison beds or deciding the number of beds they're building. And so it only makes sense strategically um, that they have a pipeline. You go in from pre-K, a lot of parents nowadays want that time off, so they're giving their children away to these school districts and kind of turning a blind eye, and then they navigate them right into the prison system. It's a million um, dollar industry, and of course it takes a lot of thought and regulation, um, and you have to look at so many different components in order to really see how much of a beast it is. There, there are really two sides to this. There's the disproportionate discipline that's meted out within school districts, suspensions, expulsions, which we know then leads to students who can least afford to miss school, missing school, and kind of the snowball effect. Um, but then there's also kind of the aggressive invol involvement of law enforcement in schools. And so I wonder if you guys can talk about some of the things that students are actually being arrested for these days, and not things that one would think, maybe like physical violence, but um, there's a laundry list of things that students are, are being charged with, sometimes even with felonies. And I wonder if you guys can, can talk about some of those things that we wouldn't expect. Yeah, so I, I mean, I have a few examples. Um, unfortunately, of all of them, most of them are in Florida. <laughs> um, so, you know, Advancement Project works a lot in Florida, but also I think in terms of some of the um, examples that Jose was talking about before that, that, are, that, that they have all, a lot of the public examples have been girls of color. Um, black girls who have been arrested and you know they've been some sort of sensational cases so you know in in 2005 um, there was a case of Jaisha Scott um, and she was you know she went into school into her kindergarten class she was five years old um, and she was just having a bad day and so she you know tore some papers from the bullet bulletin board she climbed on a table um, she allegedly hit a, a an assistant principal during the tantrum but you know keep in mind this is a five-year-old um, young girl um, and instead of using common sense um, the school called the police and um, not just one but three police officers came um, and arrested and cuffed her um, and you know this sort of made national headlines and it was a big you know um, scandal um, then there's the case of um, Kiara Wilmot who is in Polk County Florida uh, two, two years ago she was a high school student she was 16 years old um, she was um, conducting a science experiment that caused a small explosion and um, the kind of stuff that you would see on like Leave it to Beaver, you know, like they, they do an ex you know, experiment, the experiment goes wrong, the volcano, volcano explodes, um, and it emitted some smoke and um, no one was hurt, no property damage. She was, uh, had good grades and perfect behavior. She was expelled. She was forced to complete her degree through the expulsion program. Um, and she was arrested for possession of a weapon and discharging a destructive uh, device. So these are just like a couple examples. I mean, there, there have been, you know, recent cases in just in the last couple of months of other incidents of police brutality against 
uh, students. So we're not only talking about students who are getting arrested, we're talking about incidents of brutality against students. Um, and and these are, this is obviously only the tip of the iceberg for what we think is actually going on. And, and part of this problem is really it's twofold. One, it's like the fact that we do have like a police presence in schools and that police officers are you know, trained to deal with crime, not to deal with you know, adolescent or in this case, you know, you know, the to you know um, toddler behavior, you know, two-year-old, three-year-old, five-year-old behavior um, and you know, kindergarten behavior. And I think the other aspect of it is that we've seen a, an over-reliance now from teachers on going to, to um, to school resource officers or to police when they're you know not able to manage the classroom, and so I think um, there has become, as I, I think uh, Ed was saying before, this this blurred line between classroom management and like adolescent behavior and criminal behavior to the point where it's not just the pres presence of police officers, it's not just the arrests, but it's also the school codes themselves contain you know statutory language that sounds in criminal justice law. It says you know there are um, assault and battery categories, you know, and so uh, fighting is no longer fighting anymore. Um, tantrums are no longer tantrums anymore. It's now become probable cause for arrest. Did you want to add? Yeah, I was, I was going to add to that. Uh, everything you said is exactly right, and right. I think part of my concern is that if we put too much focus on the policies that need to change, whether they're suspension policies, expulsion policies, uh, the, the policies that regulate how police or school resource officers act in school, this cycle will just continue because again, what we're really dealing with is how adults interact with young people. And that's where it starts. It starts with the human interactions between two people. And we all, you know, we learn, and I, I'm a parent of four, and every, my, I remember my mom telling me that you know, parenting doesn't come with a handbook, and it doesn't. And you learn on the fly about how to raise a kid, how to change a diaper, three o'clock in the morning feedings. But lo and behold, we do have handbooks that teach adults how to better in engage and interact with young people through a positive youth development approach. And those are the type of things that are needed, whether they're teachers, whether they're school resource officers, or others in making decisions about how we deal with young people. And that's where we're woefully under-resourced, woefully not focusing and missing the mark in terms of how are we educating young people. And as he said, it's not just about the classroom education, it's also about the human development of that young person. And that's what really needs to happen to mitigate a lot of these issues. It's focusing on having better interactions. And tied to that, if, you, if we're looking at the school to prison pipeline, and, we're, and it's this wide, this long continuum, one of the things that we have to address is where, where does it really start? And in some places, you know, we, we can start with the police, we can start with expulsion policies, but we can also start with the fact that we have an over-representation over over of students who are designated special ed who are expelled or, or suspended. And part of that is the misdiagnosis of them having a, needing an IEP or individual, um, uh, what's the other? Education, education plan. plan. It's been a long day, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the, the need for that, because we categorize discipline issues as a special ed case. And so we don't treat those young people as uh, folks who are just on the developmental continuum and may need a little extra support or may need not only a caring adult but a capable adult in their life, someone who's capable of helping them manage and deal with those natural growing pains that all of us go through, uh, rather than just sticking them in special ed and then that opens the door. That's a fast lane. That's like the toll-free highway into the uh, school to prison pipeline. So let's talk about the role of race, right? Because what we do know is that these most egregious cases, five-year-olds being shackled, which we just read about last week, um, they're not typically happening to white children. Uh, not that it never happens, but it's not typical. So January of last year, the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education issued a Dear Colleague letter to school districts across the nation laying out these statistics of the disproportionate discipline of black and Latino students and warning them that the research suggests that substantial racial disparities um, are not explained just by uh, black and brown kids are behaving worse than other students. And then just last month, Researchers at Stanford found that teachers were more likely to believe that black students were who were misbehaving needed more severe discipline than white students with similar behaviors. So you kind of have the sociological research that is backing up what the data is showing us. So let's talk about the role of race mm -hmm. and, and the role that race is playing and in, in our inability to kind of deal with that. There's so much of discipline is whether I view your behavior as normal or whether I view your behavior as dangerous. 
I think that it's interesting as I was reading and preparing um, for this panel discussion, I thought a lot about how we utilize this idea that going to prison is the rites of passage. And so you have so many individuals, uh, regardless of color, um, who are dictating and using this kind of rhetoric in order to describe what the experience of incarceration is. And of course, that does not match with prisonization and what really happens there. Um, but you have some individuals uh, who really think that, you know, prison is the place for young black, violent, animalistic individuals to go in order to become parents. Um, that's really what rites of passage is if you look at it from an African American perspective or minority perspective. And so individuals are really throwing away the key and saying, you know, the research shows that there's a greater likelihood that they're going to end up there anyway. So why not get the police to come into the school, shackle them, and just take them away and make everybody's life easy? So I think it really, really starts with this idea of rhetoric and language. We don't have that language. And in the black communities, the families are not talking about it. Children are being suspended, they're being shackled down, but these discussions are not happening at the kitchen table. Sometimes there's no kitchen table. And so we fall back on the language of other individuals, which are the individuals who are shackling these families and communities. And we all kind of wrap it up to say, you know, it's a rites of passage, and it's not. It is not. I was just interject one thing mm -hmm. there, because I, I think that's a very good point. And when you consider th this is cultural and historical irony for African Americans and tied to our lineage as, as Africans, where the culture for most African communities was for the young men to go off at a certain age, usually around 12 or 13, as a rite of passage to learn to become a man. Yeah. And many people talk today that that's disappeared, that no longer happens. I posit that it happens, and it happens in our school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. That that's where majority of our African American males are going to learn to become a man, whatever that is, and usually not a good, you know, a, a good lesson or a positive lesson. And so it just, it, it just speaks to, and we've had the article that it came out, I think, last week about 1.5 million men missing. And it's not just about what's missing, it's what the impact is. And when those young men do reemerge, those who aren't dead, it's reemerging in a way that is undermining you know, our society and the things that we want for our society, but not necessarily through, totally through their fault. It's the construct that we've created. And we in passing on and bastardizing this legacy of what a right, right of passage is for an African-American male in this country. I would, yeah, I'd like to go to you um, because I think when you talked about the irony that Columbine does not have metal detectors, yeah, right? Yeah. And That's who true. we're seeing as, as, again, what behavior we're judging as criminal and what behavior we're not, depending on, on what that child looks like. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think as everybody's speaking, I'm sort of thinking about like a sort of critical race theory analysis of this, like a structural determinism and how that plays into what's going on. Yeah, well, just, just in terms of like, you know, on, on one hand, like, you know, I, I think, you know, the way that we interact with, with students is very important, right? Like the behavior is the fact that we're criminalizing all these things, implicit bias. These are important aspects, un, undeniably. But, you know, it, there is also a little bit of this, you know, um, if you step back just far enough, you can see that like the system is working actually, right? Like that it's not just, um, you know, and I think the way in which it's, that becomes crystal clear is, uh, I was actually just in, Flor in Boca Raton, Florida, um, a couple of days ago at a prison divestment conference, right? And we were um, doing an action in front of, with some community organizers in front of Geo Group, which is the second largest, you know, private prison operator in the country, uh, or if not the world, and, you know, billions of dollars flowing into Geo Group. And, they are, the profit making model is off of black bodies and black suffering, right? Like we're not talking about um, just the prison beds that you know, are, are, are assessed and, and, and counted based on you know, test scores that are happening at the, the lower levels, but we're also talking about you know, the infrastructure that for companies like Taser, which is not only providing like, law enforcement with you know, the Taser equipment, but also with the cameras, right? Like there's a, the school to prison pipeline describes a profit making um, industry mechanism that is that's very that's really vast and so um, you know I think when we're thinking about strategies on how to like counteract this and to change that I think we have to really vision and I think we have to be very aggressive in thinking about alternatives right and thinking about what real reform and transformation means and that's why I think for at least for advancement like the key the way in which we've seen the greatest um, you know, uh, advancement and, and um,
progress on this issue has really been when community organizing is at the center of it. Um, so if you look at you know, Denver Public Schools and uh, Padres y Jovenes, which has done a lot of work around changing the code of conduct, um, changing the um, intergovernmental agreement with police. Uh, if you look at Power U in Miami, which has done a lot of work around um, putting restorative justice into schools, all of those are based on community organizing. And you know, as Jose was saying, like the, the, what's one of the things that's primary to that is the storytelling that's allowed. Community organizing allows for us to move beyond the data and to allow the community actually to tell their stories. And I think that's where we get better crafting of policy, better crafting of, of alternatives and solutions. I wonder if you might talk about this as a, a classroom teacher, because a large part of the disconnect is when a kid who looks like you acts up, throws blocks at you, which is one of the things that a, a child has been arrested for, which is throwing blocks. You, if you see that child as, as like your own child or other children you know, then you just say, oh, he's just acting up. But if you see them as fitting a larger pattern of misbehavior, then you say that's just that child is being aggressive and dangerous. And I wonder if you can talk about kind of not just from your own experience, but seeing how other teachers who are not black or brown are interacting with students and, and how race plays a role. Let me start off by saying that prison is not justice. I think that's something else that seems to be underbedding a lot of what we're talking about. Uh, a lot of my students um, have known family members who have you know, gone to prison for whatever different reason. And I think these are the things that um, I think are kind of undergirding what's happening here is that it, prison is a possibility for a lot of our kids. And it's a viable possibility because they've seen their own family members do so. So you know, when you, people always say, oh, well, you could have a mentor that's a lawyer, that's a doctor. Well, some of our kids see prison as a viable pathway. So that's number one. Number two, um, I'm fairly proud to say that in my own classroom, I rarely, if ever, find a way to get my students into the dean's office. I generally handle it myself. And the reason I do it is because I rather just build a relationship with my student. And if they find, if they find themselves needing a timeout, I mean, by all means. But I, I think there's something to be said for me looking at my student as one of my own, as somebody who I've gone through that struggle with versus saying those kids, um, those animals, look at the way that they're behaving. Um, how dare they? Um, and, and that seems to be permeate with a lot of, frankly, a lot of my colleagues, a lot of the discussions. And uh, I see Sabrina Stevens in the back. A lot of the discussions we have on Twitter around EduColor, for instance, is about pushing our own white colleagues and, frankly, our non-white colleagues to reconsider the way that they talk about discipline within schools. We can't always say, oh, look, those children, uh, they, their parents never come. And look at all this, look at all that. And it's always a, a, a pathological issue with the way that we look at black kids versus saying, well, you know what? That, those are our kids, and we need to find a way to embrace them in this community. And th these are the things that we need to keep, keep cycling back around to because, unfortunately, we don't get enough stories coming out of the classroom saying, hey, listen, you know, those kids are our kids too. With a population right now of our, our teaching core, if I'm not mistaken, is around 83% white. It's about 17% of color. There's about 3% male teachers of color, uh, the rest uh, women of color. And then you mix that with the, the fact that, and I think this was a, the last study that was done by a, a couple of researchers out of Harvard that suggested that black women have the best relationship out of any sort of like race and gender mix out of any sort of teacher that we have. Yet and still, the worst relationship happens to be black men with black boys. And again, that's that uh, pathological issue that we keep discussing. It's not just happening with our white teachers. And of course, I always push the cultural competence issue with our teachers, but it's also happening within our communities as well and how we look at kids as apart from us because we've already graduated, we've already passed that. And that, that's something we, we can't have anymore. So you, Tom, already, you already touched on this a little bit, but the school to prison pipeline is often framed as a problem plaguing black boys. But we know that black girls are more likely to face suspension or expulsion than any other race or ethnic group of girls. And also, the only group that is more likely to face expulsion and suspension than black girls are black boys. So they're also more likely to be uh, suspended or expelled than boys of other races. Uh, and a recent study showed that dark-skinned black girls face actually 
higher rates and worse discipline than light-skinned black girls. So I wonder if we can talk about the challenges of addressing an issue when implicit bias is running so deep. So outside of just racial discrimination, we also are having colorism discrimination, where darker uh, children are being punished more harshly than lighter ones. Well, as a dark-skinned young man, uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I, it's, it is very interesting how in, even culturally within the African-American community, uh, shades of blackness has always been a contentious issue at times. So, um, and to see that play out, I think it goes a lot to what Jose was saying. It really comes down to how we view, uh, view our young people, view our students in school. That if we can make a decision based on just the hue of someone's skin, even within an ethnicity, it just tells us how far removed we are from actually seeing young people, youth as being humans versus the demons that uh, like culturally we've assigned to um, everything black in, in this world. And historically, you know, black has always been seen, I mean, the, the, even the terms that come out of Latin for, for things that are black have always been associated with, with negative things. And so that's a lot, of, um, a lot to overcome that's been built into our historical psyche around light is right and dark is just something very terrible that we have to contain, corral, and, and push away. And when you apply that to young women and, and you see that, it also just sort of goes against our construct of what we view women, our social construct of women as docile creatures or you know um, individuals. And then we see the raging black woman, especially if she's darker skinned, and then that even makes it more um, of an issue for us that we have to do something about. And that's why I think, in part, why those rates are going up for black women. But when we're dealing with a bias that is so ingrained, right, in our culture, which is not just race, but colorism, mm -hmm. how then is it possible to address something so deeply seated, not just among mm -hmm. white teachers right. or right. non-black teachers, but among black educators as well? It seems like that is a yeah. very difficult thing mm -hmm. to overcome. Yeah. Changing the human condition, I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the long work. I mean, that's what it takes. It all ta it takes changing our, pub, our personal orientation to the world and to those in the world. It takes changing our personal orientation, our personal will to do things differently based on seeing things differently. And that's what we're going back to what I said earlier about policies and the impact. One, yes, it takes a lot of political will to change a policy, but it takes a lot of personal will to enact a policy in the way that's fair and just across the board. And what we're dealing with on a daily day, day to day basis, it's not the policy that is necessarily leading the, to the school career uh, uh, prison pipeline. It are, it's the people who are enforcing those policies and their interpretation of actions and their interpretation of the policies. And so the work really has to start with how do we change people's minds? How do we change their hearts around their own personal orientation and how they view the students who are in front of them? Anyone else want to address? I think in terms of that discussion that you need to, there, it has to start with self-love. You have to have those conversations and we shy away from those, you know, soft um, on crime type of things because that's not the culture that we live in. But ultimately, you have to learn to love yourself because I've spoken with students who feel, light-skinned students who feel that they don't want to be that black girl that got pushed down. And they feel that that happened because of her skin color. They don't connect that to policy. So because we're not having these conversations within our communities, we could never get to the bottom of it. But also there's a lot of hurt and frustration that's embedded in those. And so I think it'll start by having these same type of conversations in schools, in communities, um, at the bottom of housing projects where they have family success centers. And for us to really learn what that language sounds like, what does it feel like, what are those stories, there's so much power um, in that and when you're able to identify your own story, it's empowering. I think it ties directly into um, post-traumatic slave syndrome, um, which really looks at this idea of how minority communities are also contributing to this idea of the years of enslavement. And back then, you know, if you're light-skinned and you're inside of the slave master's house, you're considered to be better then. And so you're starting to see a lot of those different things play themselves out in policies, but because we're not talking, we're still looking on an individual level. Yeah, and I think one, just with dad, one small thing to that, I think that when Dr. Hans is talking about like, you know, the, the storytelling, I actually think that we also need to 
fight to make spaces for young girls to tell these stories in their schools, you know, like, because it's important not only for young girls to feel like they have a safe space to do that, um, but also that their educators and that other folks are understand their stories and get to, under, and to understand and appreciate what those struggles are in order for them to understand how their actions are um, impacting young girls, especially young black girls. And it seems like there's an internal conversation that black folks have to have amongst themselves, but there's also the external conversation because all of the self-love in the world is not going to stop a teacher from seeing a dark-skinned child as, right. as being more violent, more right. prone to discipline problems. So I wonder when we're looking at that, um, how do we have those conversations when as soon as we start to talk about race, as soon as we start to talk about why discipline falls more harshly on some students than others, then <coughs> individual teachers, right, then get defensive as all of us would. I'm not racist, I don't see my, t my students differently than anyone else. If they acted right, I wouldn't do anything. How do we then, and, and these are some of the conversations obviously that you guys try to have um, all the time, and as I see you having the conversations on Twitter, Seems like it's a, it's, a, it's a tough road to hoe to get, to get teachers to recognize this, this bias, which isn't about saying I hate certain students, but that we live in a country that was you know, bred out of a, a racial caste system, and then that leaks into the classroom. So how do you, how do you change that? It's, it's got to be a multifaceted approach. I often find myself saying, um, okay, you, you know, at some point I've got to call you racist, right? Because you totally <laughs> said that, um, and I can't believe you did that. That's uh, my strategy. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> but that, that tends to be like that, that last boom, though, right, be, right before I'm like, okay, I'm just going to throw away, away Twitter. I'm done. Um, but I always start with questions, with a set of questions, and usually they go from the very large macro, so it doesn't feel as personal. So let's talk about institutional racism. Let's talk about the disparities in funding for our kids. Let's talk about uh, the inequitable policies and the way that we look at school to prison. And these are conversations I've had not just with individual teachers, but uh, with education leaders even. And I, I'm not going to go too far. I don't know how affiliated y'all are. But um, I will say that when I have these conversations with folk, it's always like, Wow, I, I really didn't think of that. Yes, duh, that's, that's called privilege. Now, um, if we can have that conversation more thoroughly, then it becomes, all right, now look, look at this personally. How did you react to this student? And why did you react the way that you did? And then we can start building from there. And maybe, and it's so funny too, um, a lot of our schools have people right within the building who every child of color runs to. Yet we never tap into that because we're so afraid to find out that in fact, we may have this implicit or explicit bias about ourselves. So um, oftentimes the kids say, oh, you know, I'm going to run to you whenever I have a problem. Like, don't run to me. Just deal with the person. But, you know, you kind of get it. You get it. How do you know that I get it? All oh, right, because of the color of my skin. Okay, so we can talk about that. But then it's also like, all right, I'm not just going to have this conversation with you. I need to have the conversation with my fellow colleagues, and i got to haul them around, and we got to have the conversation about why it is that, this child gravitates more towards me than, more to, than less towards you and build from there. Um, these are things that I constantly, I'm still struggling with as uh, one of the teachers of color who gets it. But at the same time, how do we have that in, across America in all types of schools and have conversations that will be safe so everyone can feel f safe to struggle and deal with the biases that they in inherently have and yet keep moving in a way that not just helps themselves internally, but then with their own kids. Uh, th these are conversations we need to keep pushing as well. Yeah, we need to, I'm sorry, you guys. Oh, I was gonna mention that um, one of the strategies that I've done at the university is, is that I teach my criminal justice classes in a prison. Half of the individuals are incarcerated and the other half are university students. Um, when I took my students to live at a prison for seven days, it was in West Virginia where 69% of the population were white. Um, the rest of the population, 2% African American. And so I was bringing Howard University students there. There were discussions on um, school to prison pipeline sort of things and the white officers in the room felt uneasy by the conversation. And so we put them into the circle. We actually had another circle, and it was amazing how some of the officers mentioned that all they could hear was police brutality. They didn't hear anything else that we were talking about in terms of you know, treating arrested individuals during a parent's arrest in a just way, because they were carrying things that were hurtful for them that they had gone through. And as students, they were looking at Baltimore, they were looking at Ferguson, and so they were speaking from that angle, and it allowed us to kind of have that conversation 
and have that aha moment. And really, everybody kind of wants to be heard and maybe share this information, but we also have that fear of, wow, you know, I wonder if I'm going to be seen in this kind of way. And so we really do shy away from safe spaces. We shy away from changing the narrative. Um, but these are things that definitely have a major and immediate effect. It's just like in the classroom. When you give that information, the students may not receive it immediately, but later on down the line, it's already stuck in their brains. But because we are not talking, we can only go off of the language of the land. So I just have one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. It'll leave you guys about a half hour or so. Um, so my last question has to do with kind of where do we go from here? And I know that um, I'm, I'm an investigative reporter, and so I never write hopeful things. <laughs> um, and people always want, whenever I give talks, they always want to hear you know, what, what can be done, because who wants to sit and talk about an issue that's so entrenched we can't do anything about it? So I know in last year when the, when the um, Office of Civil Rights issued that Dear Colleague letter, one of the things that they said was that uh, these racial disparities in student discipline may actually violate Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, that n just having a disparity is not automatically a violation, but you have to be able to justify why this disparity is happening. And so I'm wondering, one, are we seeing any more aggressive efforts at the federal, state, or local level that are coming from government? And then how is that working or not working with grassroots efforts um, from organizers and activists to kind of transform this system? And any of you who want to speak on that? Well, I know it. it I'm told you should never ask compound questions. So right, yeah, let's start with the first one. Are we seeing anything coming from government that, that gives us hope? And then we'll go to the next one, which is grassroots. Well, if you look at the, um, the president's uh, My Brother's Keeper um, initiative and what, in the report that came out of that task force in um, addressing um, disproportionate suspensions and expulsions and guidelines for doing that are one of the recommendations in that that uh, I think there are 72 uh, MBK challenge communities across the country, which are cities or municipalities who've signed on to develop action plans based on those recommendations. So that's one driver um, that has gotten the conversation, uh, continued the conversation around how do we address the school to prison pipeline that's coming out from the, from the federal government that hopefully will be supported uh, at the local level by philanthropic and local government agencies. I don't know, at our university, the president just signed on to an initiative that is creating a school to university pipeline, which uh, counters the school to prison pipeline where they're going to be going into the community schools, Banneker North, which is right across the street from us, and allowing students to get college credits and be able to pipeline directly into Howard University as opposed to going to a community college. And so they're going into those schools and pulling those kids out and bringing them into the university. Um, with my classes, I also uh, bring the Howard University students into Banneker so that they can see university students and have conversations, but also inviting them to the campus as well. Yeah, and I think actually we're seeing a little bit of a cross, like sort of uh, cross-pollination between what the um, organizing is doing and what's happening at the federal and state level. So um, actually in the, the recent interim report on 21st century policing, the president's task force around this, one of the recommendations was um, implementing restorative justice models, right? And so um, we've seen in different jurisdictions, um, you know, New York is one, you know, um, you know, to some degree in Baltimore and now in Florida and De in Denver that jurisdictions are now, not only have organizers done an amazing job of making restorative justice like a viable option, um, but uh, administrators are starting to even approach, you know, advancement and other organizations and community organizers and say, hey, you know, maybe we should, maybe we should think about other ways of doing this. Like this isn't working. We see that our disparities are, are really high and we've got to, you know, we've got to figure out some strategies. And so they're actually opening the door to some community organizations to come in and work with them directly. And um, I think that that's, you know, I, I still think that the, the overall picture around racial disparity is something we should be honest about and we shouldn't sugarcoat, um, you know, even with restorative justice and better training um, because the system is what the system is. But I do think that there is some promise, particularly in these restorative justice initiatives um, and also because restorative justice really does flatten the power dynamic a lot and it really does empower students in the classroom setting and teachers to, to sort of treat each other as like on a much more horizontal kind of almost collegial level, so. I was, I was gonna mention the set of activists that are students that are popping up all over the country. I think there's we, as my friend Sheehan Barrett would say, there, there's a, a severe case of adultism mm -hmm. 
that happens whenever we have these panels and that mm -hmm. um, we, we tend to look at ourselves as the agents of change instead of trying to say, well, do the students have a voice in this? And if they do, then let's hear it. So that's one. And that's happening in places like Newark, Philadelphia, mm -hmm. LA, I mean, Oakland, goodness gracious. I mean, really good, powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're not just talking about uh, anti-testing or comic code, whatever. They're also talking about the experiences and the lack of fun and engagement they're having at school. And they're pushing their adults to do better as well. Mm -hmm. Number two, I'm seeing it in my own district, uh, Carmen Farina has um, tried to restrict the disciplinary uh, policies to a point to try to bring suspensions down by recoding a lot of what's happening in our discipline policies um, and trying to disarm a lot of folk from just suspending kids over and over and over again I try to keep them within school and that that hopefully will make a sea change um, I think those are the two big things I'm looking at right now okay so we're gonna open it up and um, <coughs> we need you to ask the question into the microphone so anyone have any questions for the panel Uh, I was wondering, um, in your experience and in your research, um, if school uniform policies have affected the um, the school to prison pipeline at all? Well, it's certainly given them another reason to uh, write someone up for an infraction, uh, whether they actually have the uniform on and it's not shirts not tucked in, don't have a belt, uh, you know, hemline is up too high, or you're not wearing the complete uniform in the way it's supposed to be. So it's just added to one of the other things that you can check as a reason to suspend or discipline a child. And of course, all the schools, specifically charter schools that are making um, kids pay whenever they don't have a certain uniform. Make them pay 50 bucks every time they don't got a belt on, please. So probably not in the way you might have hoped. <laughs> school uh, hip-hop artist by the name of Cool G Rap had a song come out and it was called Rikers Island and the part of the hook was you, you won't be smiling when on Rikers Island so um, I bring that up because the man in the middle has spoken about the, this new age uh, rites of passage being going to prison at some point in time going to prison had been um, popularized amongst the youth so when my brother heard the song he said yeah I'm gonna go to Rikers Island and then three months later when he ended up in Rikers and then eight months after that got out because his charges was dropped he was practicing his prison poses in the mirror. And then he had me come next to him so he can have us both do a pose. He was like, yeah, Rook Brothers caught 40 kilos cocaine, $20 million. There has been this glamorization of going to prison within our urban youth. And while we're working on it from the outside of the pipeline, trying to affect policy change, trying to make sure that the educators know that they need to have a, a, a cultural, multicultural approach with dealing with our children, what can we do on the inside of the pipeline so that our youth don't become complicit in our own new age enslavement? I think exposure. I mean, yeah. you have to expose these children to things outside of the urban ghettos that they're used to. They need to go to libraries. They need to go to museums. You have to, you know, start really early with them because they get bored with us. Like, we are... Um, older but you have to understand that there's a technology age and that means it's fast that's like a microwave fast so you have to be creative on your toes not <laughs> overworked ready to really engage these critical minds take them outside of the realm a lot of the young individuals who i've worked with they've never been out of newark so i bring them to new york they've never been out of east orange so we bring them into irvington neighboring cities and different areas teach them about their history teach them about nutrition. I mean, you have to get them excited about the good things. And a lot of the times we think, oh, just mentoring. You know, that's all you need, one hour of mentoring with someone who's doing a good job, which is great. Mentoring is working, the research is there, but the, uh, the breed of children who are coming out now are just different and they're really fast. I'm glad you, you brought up that point about the, using that rap as, um, as an example of what you're talking about because when we're dealing with the culture, the hip hop culture that has become very pervasive that glamorizes these things. Every time that we try and deal with it is like bringing a knife to a gunfight. The pervasive nature of the entertainment industry, it's what we have co-opted or what they've co-opted is they're selling our young to our young uh, black people that this is their culture when all it is is commerce. It is something that they've packaged in order to sell records and sell other things and we have not done enough to inoculate them against this isn't a representation of you, this is someone's glamorizing something so that you can buy their record, video, whatever it is. 
and that's a part of the that's a part of the struggle is how do we combat that uh, with all the things that you were talking about that they need to do. But again, it's so pervasive, it's so endemic. It's you know with social media, it's like every time that we try and catch up to it, it's already moved to a different platform. And so part of the fight is how do we get in front of it, and how do we work with our young people from the inside, internally within themselves, to have enough self-esteem and be strong enough to resist that temptation of buying into what's being sold to them, which isn't a representation of who we are historically or ever have been. So I know I'm the moderator, but I just have to speak up for the hip hop generation. <laughs> um, I, I think hip hop makes a great scapegoat for a lot of societal yes. inequities. Thank and you. I think if you look at, I don't know that black youth are aspiring to go to prison. I think that's ridiculous. I think we pathologize our youth just like everyone else. What I will say is if you look at the statistics, they're actually being pretty smart about what the statistics are predicting for them. When one of three black men have, the odds are that one of three black men will be incarcerated at some point. You can go into many of these school districts and that's higher than their odds of graduating from high school and it's certainly higher than their odds of going to college. So I think that what we really need to understand is our youth are reflecting what society is, is, is giving to them. Um, it's not hip hop, sorry. Yeah. I just, I, I yeah, have to, I, I know I'm the, I'm the moderator and I'm a journalist, but I, I it's not hip hop. That. I'll, I'll, second, I'll that. second that motion. <laughs> yeah, I agree, Third. I definitely agree with that positive youth development. But I think the reality is that most of us recognize that there's a horrific lack of positive youth development in our schools. Um, I, we work closely with DC Public Schools could and I think any, so we could see sure, you? I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, I was noting that a number of you use the concept uh, of positive youth development. Um, but I think all of us, any of us who have engaged in a, many of the schools around the country recognize a woeful lack of positive youth development utilized by administrators, uh, teachers, parents and other students and um, watch, in fact, the negative approach uh, many adults have to engaging with young people and the demoralizing behavior that they have to encounter um, on a regular basis. Um, you know, we in our organization use a lot of uh, current uh, positive youth development practices, but when we try to teach them to people who work with our program in places where we control the environment, um, we get a lot of pushback because it runs counter to what a lot of people uh, where a lot of people operate from their gut. You know, we call it tough love. They call it going old school on people. But what it really is, is demoralizing young people in a way that leaves them uh, so torn down that by the time they get into a place where they're even engaging with adults, uh, they don't have a lot to rely on. Let's think about, you know, just having kids walk into a school system, standing in a long line to go through uh, a metal detector, the manner in which security guards often engage with our young people, and then they get into the building after going through this process every single day, and then they get into the hallway where they have an administrator screaming at them or yelling at them for some one person or two person's behavior. So uh, my, my question is, how do, we, how do we change that conversation? How do we get uh, adults to understand that maybe we have to move from what we think is the old school way of doing things to a more positive way of engaging with young people, which we just don't see a lot of uh, in, in a lot of our school systems settings. For those who don't who don't know the jargon, what are examples of positive youth development? What, what are you talking about? Um, engaging young people in problem solving. Uh, the way you greet someone when they appear to have broken a rule. So uh, I'll give you an example. A student shows up late for school, and so you know traditionally. Uh, They'd be dealt with harshly. Why are you late? You know you're late. You, you get detention, you have this. Versus in a positive youth development model, you may ask, the well, first of all, welcome the student to school. Thank them for making the effort to come. And then dialoguing with them to find out what may have made them late. Um, in many instances, we'll find that uh, students are caring for younger siblings or an, uh, or an elder or, or doing something that required them to problem solve before getting to school. And so they've already come and overcome a number of hurdles just to get there. And yet the first adult or one of the earlier adults they encounter, you know, greets them negatively. Positive youth development would say, let's have a conversation. So, you know, I discovered that you're late because you're caring for your grandmother who's sick. Or you had to get two of your siblings to do two different daycare centers. So what can we do together to help you get to school on time while respecting the fact that you're doing something that's very responsible, and I'm respecting that. that, that that's a, a positive youth development model. Thank you. Are there other questions? 
Yeah, I, I want to say uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and, and to the uh, panel up there, and also to uh, Sister Muhammad, if I'm pronouncing correctly. She's the one invited me to come here. My name is Denver Hawkins Bay, and I just want to uh, briefly, uh, I kind of like what the gentleman was saying there. I don't know his name with the gray suit on there and the purple tie, you know. And what he was saying make a lot of sense, and basically a lot of stuff for everybody on the panel. But the thing is, is that, you know, we are living in a microwave society, and meaning that, you know, uh, instant gratification, you know, people are very impatient now. Uh, nobody has the time to wait for this and that. If you notice, a lot of people running to the subway or the bus or whatever, you know, it's like the house on fire, you know. And uh, kind of excuse me if I say I'm broke up and what I'm saying, you know, and as far as the prison system is concerned, you know, until you actually experience and been there and, 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 and seen the type of set that's going on in there, you really don't know. You're going by what you read or what you hear. You know, you have a lot of gangs in the system now, you know. They're young, you know, and I would never use the word thug like the president used or, 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 the, or the mayor over Baltimore used, you know, which I think is a really un, an inappropriate word, you know, uh, which is really an, uh, uh, another word for, for the N-word, you know. And the, and the thing is, is that it's, it's really no programs in the system, you know, and it's, they just being warehouse, you know, because... And, 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 and I just want to say this here, you know, and, and, and it's, it's a big business, you know. You have at least 10 colleges or more that uh, have stock in these prison systems, you know. Okay, excuse me. Thank you. And then we have one up front after that. Hi there. Um, I had two questions. I wanted uh, Dr. Muhammad to elaborate a little bit on what you were saying about health care in the prison system. I wanted to understand a bit more about that. And then for any of the panelists, if you had thoughts about the, the convergence of, of state violence and privatization, right, that we're warehousing kids in schools that are more and more like prisons and that have on-ramp for selected kids to prison, and I wonder if that's part of the same impetus to make money off schools that we're seeing um, being driven by these surplus people that we don't have places for in the economy and in the labor market once they become adults. Are we just pushing it back by a few years and starting to, to commodify them in, um, in schools? In terms of the health care, that's speaking directly to uh, the bids that go into private prisons. So there's a bidding rate for everything that goes on the commissary down to the care for the individuals who are incarcerated. And from some research that comes out of Princeton University, they have identified that the majority of bids that are being accepted and that provide the lowest rate um, on the dollar for individuals who are incarcerated are for younger individuals. So the younger you come into the system, the more likely it is that you would be able to get health care services. And a prison cannot run without those health care services. And so that is feeding the school to prison pipeline. If you get them younger, they're worth a lot more dollars. It's just like health care. If you work at a job where people are 60 and older, um, it's a lot more money in order to fund that population. And it's a lot cheaper um, health-wise if you're younger. <coughs> Good evening. Uh my name is Jamal Abdulalim. I'm a freelance journalist here in D.C. Um, you know, the first time I heard this um, idea that um, prison beds that uh, were based on test scores, um, I thought that that would be an interesting story to write. Um, you know, it would be interesting to see the committee <coughs> or whatever governmental agency it is that actually does this. And <coughs> I spent some time looking into it. It appears to be a myth, mm -hmm. and so I've uh, abandoned it. Um, and anytime I hear it repeated, it kind of annoys me because, you know, it's a very serious allegation to say that there's a governmental agency somewhere sitting up, planning how many prison beds there would be based on third grade, grade reading scores. I almost let it slide, but when I heard two panelists say basically the same thing, so I'm willing to be educated. If you have a citation for it. Please, please Definitely feel free to share don't, it. Don't give it up. Um, I just took my students into the Maryland Department of Corrections, and the way that you find that information out is inside of the prison. So in Maryland, they outsource um, and create all of the prisons. 
around the nation. They do the research on the inside that identifies how big the prison's gonna be. They're building a new one now in Maryland, and they use the statistics from the school district in order to build it. And so, of course, it's going to come out as being a myth because nobody wants you to be able to put your finger on it so that you don't think about it. But I would say that you need to, um, if you uh, are in contact with me, I could put you in contact with that uh, particular facility. There's no researcher that's going to write about it. There's no researcher that's going to be able to get into a prison and get the warden of that facility to say, yes, I'm going to allow you to interview these people to say that this is what we're doing. Um, it's also about money for them. So you have to go about it from the back door. And a lot of the prisons are being built and infrastructure by a CAD system. CAD systems are now being taught inside the prisons to incarcerated individuals. So that means that those jobs are no longer on the outside. Those are jobs that are only on the inside of prison. So you won't be able to talk to someone on the outside to say, how did you develop the, the blueprint for this prison? But those blueprints are being developed from the prisoners first, and then they're being outsourced um, through private organizations. So that information is just not public, because it's not a public um, revenue. So there is a story there, and there are ways to get, a, uh, get at it. Hi, I'm Ken Fielding. Uh, I'm a, a journalist as well, and uh, the former director for Civil and Human Rights for the United Methodist Church. Uh, it's not a myth. Um, you alluded to Florida. Uh, I know of a case in Florida where the um, Wackenhut, the president of Wackenhut CEO, which is a prison builder, actually meets with the state superintendent of schools to identify, I guess, a class of black youth that are not achieving at the third grade level to decide how many beds and where Wackenhut, which is a prison builder, can build his prisons. So that's on record. So it's not a myth at all. It's going I have up. to say I also tried to track down that statistic and similar stories in every, I could not, and I'm a pretty good investigative reporter, and I could not track it down either. Yeah, but it's been, it's been recorded where there's been actual meetings between Wackenhut and school superintendents, and I'm aware of them. Okay, well, send me some documents because I would love to write the story, but I've never been able to prove it either. Hi, I'm going to stand kind of short. Um, so I do a lot of uh, looking into uh, early childhood research and like uh, preschool spaces. And so when we were talking about preschool suspensions and expulsions, like one of the things you run into when you're like researching is the notion of challenging behaviors and how a lot of like what's written on like school to prison pipeline or like preschool to prison pipeline focuses on like what to do if a child has a challenging behavior. And a lot of like the research starts at that point rather than like asking like how one defines a challenging behavior or like who's doing the identification of if a behavior is challenging and all those things. So I wonder like from the panel if there's any way to affect the process of like how we research and talk about these like from like a scholarly level so that the people who like work in policy and other different spaces can like effectively talk about it. Well, a part of it is understanding, um, starting with child development, um, if you're dealing with younger uh, youth in that age range and also youth development, it's for having a basic understanding of the developmental nature and the correlated activities, um, actions, and behaviors that young people have. And so when you understand that, then it's easier not to codify certain behaviors as challenging, but understand that young people at a certain age do have a hard time in times um, expressing themselves if they're in a stressful situation or something doesn't agree with them. I mean, we, if for those who've had kids, we deal with that at home all the time. It, it's no different than what happens in the classroom. And um, when we're talking about youth development principles, one of the founding elements of it is having, giving young people voice and agency in their own development. As soon as, and which is why it's hard for people in authority to adopt a youth development uh, framework because they feel that I'm the authority and it starts with me and ends with me, but young people having some, some uh, you know, power in their own agency, in, in agency over what happens to them, whether it's in a classroom setting or not, is a part of the dynamic that we have to address. And so part of it, again, is understanding and making sure that adults who work with young people, whether in, in, across any sector, have the tools necessary to identify and assess what behavior is and then act appropriately and not go by some blueprint that someone gives them that says, if a child does this, that's bad, and therefore you can do this to them and, send, and put them into the pipeline. So that, that's, that's where I would start. We probably have time for one more question. 
quick comment. So you mentioned the Dear Colleague letter from the Department of Ed and Department of Justice. I just wanted to raise also that HHS and the Department of Ed released a, a policy statement in December on expulsion and suspension in early learning settings. So it includes the pre-K, child care, everything. Um, and it includes a series of recommendations for states and programs. It talks about inappropriate behavioral expectations. Um, it talks about a lot of the issues that have been described here. Some of the, we actually <laughs> had to explicitly put in there that programs should not use language drawn from the criminal justice system because we heard of cases where preschoolers were being put on probation, um, where they were using three strikes and you're out language. Um, so anyway, I would refer folks to that. It's on HHS's and Ed's websites. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer Lee Oprahori. I'm a journalist, um, but my question is more out of um, interest than reporting. Um, when I was in school in Jersey City in undergrad, a lot of my friends were education majors, and at some point, everyone um, goes through the student teacher phase, and a resounding thing that I heard was, please don't send me to Snyder, um, because a lot of people were afraid to go into this school for the same reasons that Dr. Muhammad brought up, um, about just kind of being afraid of students, of um, different backgrounds than who, what they were raised within. So I was wondering, we talked about interventions with teachers who are currently in these systems, but is there anything going on on the student teacher level um, so that we might be able to kind of counteract the paranoia uh, before these people are actively exposed to children? There's um, a lot of discussion around the idea of cultural competence, starting from teacher ed schools all the way up. And there are those of us who are act actively uh, working with folks to develop those sorts of uh, conversations. Here's something I think about when I, I hear you say that. Oftentimes we don't prepare teachers for the places they are going. And that's the main basis for having cultural competence to begin with. We're not preparing teachers to just teach. We're preparing teachers to teach students. And we're not just preparing them to teach students, but preparing them to teach the students that they are going to be teaching. And so uh, uh, it has to be hyper-local in a way that makes sure that the teachers understand the skills necessary to walk into a building and develop that sort of compassion along racial and gender lines because that's a big conversation. I think a lot of that, will, a lot of the things that we we're talking about now will dissipate once you start having those conversations in a more thorough level. Secondly, we need to develop mechanisms within our school systems to have the conversations because the biggest p professional development that happens isn't at the teacher prep level, it's happening right at the school. So if, you, if you're a teacher that's been in the school now for like let's say four or five years, then you've already passed the, I guess the master's phase where you, know, you get your master's, you get your certification, now you've got a due process, tenure, whatever have you. And yet and still, teachers need to keep learning because that's the way we build. But we're not learning how to deal with culture, we're learning how to raise test scores and how to uh, gain, uh, well, in, I know this DC, how to game the system to get more bonus money. Um, so I, I know how that works. And unfortunately, that's just not the way it, 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 we don't build better teachers by trying to focus on a very narrow sense of how they teach. So our teacher evaluation systems are not built towards getting kids to become better people. They're built around teaching them how to be better test takers. So that, that's something that we need to ha keep having a conversation about. How do we measure achievement not just on an academic level, but on a personal level. And I think one of that, that piece we're talking about is really going to help us have the conversations in schools about race and gender in class because we want to make better people. OK, it's now 6 o'clock. I don't know if anyone in New America wants to make uh, closing remarks. But if not, then thank you all for coming and, and uh, taking part in this important conversation. And thank you to all the panelists.